Enrichment, Enlightenment, Transformation. Rabbi Yisroel Cutler, the spiritual leader of Chabad of Cary, North Carolina, guides anyone who has been searching for a meaningful life and conscious living. Join our discussions about the mundane, our daily activities, and then infuse every day with a spiritual twist from the inspired sages of the Talmud and Jewish mysticism, which many call Kabbalah. We learn from the root source of all religious monotheistic traditions and delve into the symbolism and levels of meaning from biblical stories. We love having you join with Chabad of Kerry, our lunch and learn, grow together, study together, let us know you're listening uh, on the chat box. Give us your name. You can ask questions, but it really adds to the program when we know that you are here with us. Um, just a quick note to everyone. We're going to keep the door closed here because across the hallway, they have a teleconference going on at 12 o'clock. And they asked if on the way out today, we could do all our schmoozing in here instead of doing it in the hallway. So just a little request from them to leave um, quietly today when, when we leave. We are at the point in the Jewish calendar where things get confusing, things get tricky. And I'll, we've mentioned this before. We're going to add an extra month soon. Right? We had an early, relatively early Hanukkah this year. We had a, not a Thanksgiving Chukah. That was a few years ago, but it's still a relatively early Hanukkah. We're going to have a very late Pesach, historically late Pesach this year. Mm. It starts April 24th, the 22nd, 23rd, 22nd. 22nd. The last day of Pesach, the finished Passover on April 30th is, I don't remember, a year like that, mm -hmm. where it finishes almost in May. Mm -hmm. And next year, it's not just Pesach that's late, that will continue next year. Hanukkah begins on December 24th ending on New Year's. So that is wow. historically late. Mm. We know the general reason for that, but why is this leap year even later than other leap years? Well, it must be on the very end of the rule for when you insert a leap month. So we're going to do some of that today. And I know we've discussed before some of the laws, but let's take it in the book. Where is this from? And what is the meaning behind it? Why is it so confusing in Judaism? You know, most religions... <laughs> You have your holiday, boom, that's when it is. And in our religion, it's a late Hanukkah, it's an early Rosh Hashanah. It's, a, it's so confusing. Every year it makes for a lot of discussion. And yes, you're going to say that's because we're trying to reconcile two different things. We're living in America, and we're trying to reconcile the normal calendar with the Jewish calendar. But nonetheless, even the Jewish calendar is confusing because the Jewish calendar attempts to reconcile between two different things. We're going to discuss that today, as well, both legally as well as its meaning spiritually and mystically, yeah. I don't know if you're going to cover it, but if somebody has a birthday in Adar and it wasn't a leap year, do they do you celebrate it in the first Adar or the second Adar? That is Adar? a very good question. Let me just clarify her question. The equivalent would be what happens if someone's birthday is February 29th, okay? And this year, I believe there is a February 29th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is or is not? There is. Mm -hmm. So... If they were born on February 29th, when do they celebrate their birthday most, most years? Do they do it on February 28th, or do they do it on March 1st? <laughs> what is the answer to that? Whenever they want. <laughs> Whenever they want. Jewishly, there's something significant, spiritually significant about a birthday. It's the day your neshama, your soul, came into the world. I like looking at it as more than it's the day you were born, but rather it's the day God created you. It's active. It's a day to focus on purpose and meaning, and there's spiritual significance to your soul being especially vibrant on your birthday. And hence, when do you celebrate your birthday? That's a big deal. But in Judaism, it's not just an extra day that is a leap year. It's an extra month. So it's not a one in, you know, one in 1,000 chance someone being born on February 29th. The odds are not so rare that someone is born... In, in a year where there are two Adars, like we're going to explain today, there's a whole extra month every couple years, 
And if they're born or they have a yard site during that, when do they celebrate it? And the flip side is also true. If someone is born in a regular year in which there is only one Adar, okay? I want to make sure everyone understands this. This year there are two Adars. Adar is the name of the month before Pesach. Usually there's regular Adar and then you go to the month of Pesach. This year there's an extra Adar. Adar 1, Adar 2. So what happens if someone just has a birthday in Adar and this year's a leap year? Do they celebrate it in the first Adar or the second Adar? That's your question. What's the easy answer? Have two birthdays. <laughs> For a month. Celebrate it, but what, what would you think the answer should be? I would think it would be the next month. Right, and the reason for that is the second Adar is the standard Adar. It's the first Adar that is the extra added month. What's the proof of it? What is the holiday that is best known, the, the holiday that everyone talks about in Adar? Purim. 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 This is book. So Purim is in the second Adar, which seems to signify that it's the second Adar that is the regular Adar, and it's the first Adar that is added. Most people do it that way. I don't know why this is so. But there's a tradition that when it comes to a yard site, it's observed in the first Adar. And the birthday in the second Adar. Huh. And I, it seems to be contradictory. Why should there be any difference between the two? Mm. I wasn't expecting the question, Judy. I need to do She's further read. No, it's a great question. Well, my Why is it? Sites in Adar and my ch both of my children were born in Adar. So, so <laughs> typically people will observe the yard site in the first Adar. Let's now go to the text. We are on page 89. Really, 88 is an introductory text. I'll just paraphrase it. This is very interesting. How central is the Jewish calendar to Judaism? Well, sometimes you know how central something is by how much opposition those people have that are against it. So the text one is actually from the story of Hanukkah, where the person, the Greek king named Antiochus, who wanted to outlaw Judaism. He wanted to get rid of Jewish spirituality. He said, I'm violating, look at the last three lines, let us rise up against them and annul their covenant they made with God. Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and circumcision. So Shabbat I get. Shabbat's a pretty big one. Circumcision has always been very important to Jews. It begins with Abraham. Um, you know, it's, it's something in our, in our flesh. We, we see why that is critical to Judaism. <coughs> Rosh Chodesh is the first day of the month. That's what Rosh Chodesh means, the beginning of a month. Why would that be seen as something so important that the Greeks want to stamp that out? Let's get rid of their... What do you think? Rosh Chodesh? It was our first commandment. Okay, so that is true, that the, the first thing that was told to the Jews when they left Egypt was the Jewish calendar in Rosh Chodesh. Okay. Yeah. It sets us apart. It, you're right, it sets us apart. You know, when I write a paper and I say on the top, I give both a secular date and a Jewish date, that's significant. That's a different way of, associ of associating yourself. When I say I have two birthdays, a secular and a Jewish birthday, that is significant. So it, it may not seem so. Yeah, it's a cow. No, but it's a whole way we live our lives that's governed by something very, very important. And of course, scheduling, you know, you're always looking at what the Jewish calendar is. Oh, Yom Kippur, I can't do it. So it is significant. So what were you going to suggest, Hal? That we are a religion of, of time, not of space. Mm. And the, the other societies are much more into the place. That's interesting. Judaism is all over the world, so time was always something that brought us together. That's neat. Never thought about that. Yeah, ben? Also, when you look at circumcision and Shabbat, those are things that you do inside. Nobody can see it if nobody wants to see it. Like it's you know. Whereas the calendar, when you're talking to people and relating to people, it's more out there. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because whenever you interact with people, yeah. that is something that will come up. But I mean, I, I don't think it means just Rosh Chodesh here. It means our calendar. Yeah. And I know that even Jews, let's say, that are not that engaged in Judaism, a big deal for them is to have a Jewish calendar. That's, that's big. People want to know. I know when people were sent to Siberia, okay, a long time ago in Russia, sent away or sent to prison, and you can only bring a few Jewish items with you. 
Maybe you want to bring a prayer book. Maybe you want to bring a, a Chumash Bible. Get, a lot of people wanted to have their, they wanted to bring a calendar with them. Mm -hmm. Just think, I mean, God forbid, we shouldn't know what that means, but that, that's it. They want to know when Yom Kippur is. They want to know when Pesach is. So a calendar is, is it actually does make sense why the Greeks wanted to outlaw it. So we have, we should realize that the Jewish calendar is important to us, not just because of the holidays, but the whole institution and the whole way that it is a way of, of identifying as Jews. Here's where things get tricky. So in the Torah portion this week, we are told about the holidays. It comes at the end of a lot of technical laws. Most years in the Lunch and Learn, we focus on those laws, those mishpatim, that's the name of the parsha. But at the end of the parsha, we are told about the holidays. Pam, 2-8. Three times you shall slaughter sacrifices to me during the year. You shall observe the festival of unleavened bread, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I have commanded you at the appointed time of the month of Aviv, springtime, for then you left Egypt, and they shall not appear before me empty-handed. Then it goes on to mention two more holidays, the holidays of Shavuot, which is 49 days after Pesach, and Sukkot. Those are the only three that get mentioned in this week's Torah portion. Okay, But what does it say about Passover? It says it's a feast of, a holiday of matzah, a holiday where we don't have chametz. You are celebrated at the appointed time in Aviv. Anyone know anyone with the name Aviv or Aviva is a, is a girl's name in, 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 in Israel? What does Aviv mean? Spring. Well, that's the way it translates it here. We know today Aviv means spring. What is the etymology of that word, though? Rebirth or something like that? Interesting. Yes, yeah, exactly. So the commentators all struggle with what is Aviv. Um, one says, if you look at, at, at Tubi, why don't you read? They're, they're struggling with what does Aviv mean, especially because it says the month of Aviv. So why don't you read Janice, Tubi? This is one of the commentators, Rashi. The month of Aviv, the month in which the grain fills out in its moisture. Alternate, alternatively, Aviv is an expression related to the word for a father, Aviv, ah, the firstborn right. and the earliest month to ripen fruits. So Aviv means moisture. I, I'm not, I don't quite understand the agriculture here. <laughs> what happens to the seed? What kind of moisture fills in the seed? Anyone can help me out what that means? Well, you know, the, the top head, you know how weed is, and it puffs <laughs> out into that little uh, seed pod. Ah. That's, yeah. And then it dries up after? Well, then you're supposed to harvest, and then it's done. I'm not, I, I don't know what it, it's something to do with moisture and agriculture. And the second one is sort of like the rebirth of means the father. And it is the beginning of the entire year, but it does mean spring. So the Torah identifies Pesach very strongly with, it has to be in the Aviv. It has to be in the spring. Now, why was that so important to the Jews? So, um, and, and again, a, another time in the Torah as well, when the Jews are actually leaving Egypt, Moshe tells them the same thing. Why don't you read 3a on page 90? Jackie, I'm going to skip to 3a. Today you are going out in the month of Aviv. Spring. So Moshe says, Get Jews, we're leaving. Guess what? We're leaving in the spring. <laughs> what does he want to tell them? What's the meaning of that? Now, did they not know in what month they went out? <laughs> Rather, this is what Moses said to them. See the loving kindness that he bestows upon, bestowed upon you. He took you out in a month in which it is suitable to go out, when there is neither heat nor cold, nor rain, and so it says, he takes prisoners out at the most opportune time, in the month when it is best suited to go on. Okay, so Moshe saying, look what a loving God, you know? God planned the timing perfectly. It wasn't a coincidence that he left in the spring. Now, they didn't realize it was gonna be 40 years in the wilderness, and they were gonna see many different climates during that time, but at least had the plan gone as, as it should have, and it would have been a lot quicker entry into the land of Israel, they would have left during the better time of year. So Aviv means spring, and we see here that Passover being in the spring is very important. Um, and the Torah says it, it must be in the spring. Rabbi. And it wasn't just the original Passover. We know that the holidays of the year are associated with agriculture. Today it's not so important to us, 
because we don't live in an agrarian society other than the little gardening some of you guys might do in the yard. Your life doesn't revolve around the agricultural cycles, but for a long time it was that way. Rabbi, and the, yes. There is a comment uh, on, on what, you can't hear me? I can, oh. thank you. Uh, on, on Blab here from WPC Guy, he says, the first thing told Israel following the exodus from Egypt after the Passover was the festival of unleavened bread, an 80-day Sabbath. An 80-day Sabbath? An eight, sorry, eight-day Sabbath. I'm sorry. So they were told about, if, they, if you look at the way, way beginning of chapter 12 of Exodus, and may, you know what? I said the first thing the Jews were told when they left Egypt. Let me rephrase that. The first command the Jews were given just before they left Egypt, at the way beginning of Exodus chapter 12, that's when it talks about the new moon and the calendar system. So yes, I, I stand corrected that that is what the Jews were told just prior to their leaving Egypt, the first time they got a command as a nation. The first thing they were told is this month will be a new uh, uh, the, the calendar system. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, so we see later on that the holidays are associated with the with with, with the agriculture. Four A. Huh? <clears throat> and the festival of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you shall sow in the field, and the festival of the in gathering, at the departure of the year, when you gather in the products of your labors from the field. So. Passover is the holiday when things are growing in the field. Shavuot is the holiday when things are <coughs> harvested. And finally, especially for fruit trees that sometimes can go throughout the summer, Sukkot, which is in the fall, is in gathering. They would keep everything outdoors in the field and bring things indoors right before winter would start in the fall. So the three big holidays are very much associated with it. Parenthetically, there's something very interesting that in the Torah, when it discusses Passover, it talks about the holiday, but nowhere does it say the word you should be happy. How do you say happy in, in uh, Hebrew? Uh -huh. Sameach, simcha. Ashrei is fortunate, simcha, happy. When it discusses Shavuot, it says you should be happy once. When it discusses Sukkot, three times in the Torah it says simcha, 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 which is interesting. So at least from an agricultural perspective, the answer is, People are still kind of nervous Passover time. Things are just starting to grow. It's hard to be happy. Is it going to be a good year? Is it not going to be a good year? People were nervous. 49 days later, once they saw the beautiful stalks of wheat fully ripe, it was easier to ha be in a state of, of simcha, happiness. And then if it was a good year, the holiday of Sukkot, and you bring everything once it's in the bank, or in the storage houses, that's when you could truly be this simcha. Um, so... This was a big part of Jewish life, the agriculture and the way it related to the holidays. Okay. So what do we see? Our, our calendar is very much associated with the seasons of the year, mm -hmm. an agricultural cycle, and Passover happened to be in the spring, both originally, and God was so nice to take them out in good weather, as well as long-term. Okay. The problem, of course, is we're not only based upon the agriculture. Going back to Exodus chapter 12, the verse that I just quoted, 6a now, on page 94. Okay. God, <clears throat> God spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the head of the months. To you it shall be the first of the months of the year. So the holiday of Passover falls in the Jewish month of Nisan. This is to be the first month of the year. And when God said this month, the word in Hebrew is hachodesh hazeh, this. Mm -hmm. When you say the word zeh in Hebrew, mm -hmm. you are giving a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you are pointing to something. So do the next text. God showed Moses the moon in its renewal and said to him, when the moon renews itself, you will have a new month. So God actually showed Moshe what it looks like, the cycle of the moon. Mm -hmm. That first moment where you can't see the moon at all and boom, you see that tiny sliver, that becomes Rosh Chodesh. That becomes the head of the month. And God established right from the beginning that our calendar was to be primarily dependent upon the month. And that is what sets us apart. So just really quickly, the secular calendar 
I think it began in Roman times, the current calendar that we have today, um, is based upon the cycle of the Earth going around the sun. And that takes 365 and a quarter days. That is what the year is. It is inherent. It's something inherent. That is the cycle. The fact that there are months in the year, that's arbitrary. Okay. In fact, if you go back to early, early Roman civilization, mm -hmm. they actually had 10 months. Mm -hmm. You know that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, they had a Julian. Ten, ten, Julia, 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 10 months. Augustus, ten, ten. Meaning there's nothing in special about a month. But what's special is the year. The year is a natural phenomena. It takes 365 and a quarter to go around. Mm -hmm. They wanted an easy way to divide. to divide it. What's a good number? <laughs> so in the end, tw at the beginning it was 10. In the end, it settled at 12. What is the difference between the Julian and the Gregorian? What was the, the switch that happened? What? They, um, um, they added in July and August. Julius, Julius Augustus, mm. Caesar. Julius and Augustus. Um, and so October, which mm -hmm. used to be 8, ought 8. Interesting. That was the 10th month. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. November, November 9, 9 this, this 11th. December and December, 10. which is 10, is now 12, because they got pumped. Mm -hmm. So that was added by whom? Julius. Julius. So what, Augustus. Augustus. what did Gregorian add to it then, the, when we see the Gregorian calendar? That's, that is, that's, 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 that's what we call it. Okay, that is a good Okay, okay. <laughs> but in any event, that, it, it, it is all solar, okay? And then we have the flip side. You know what? This is actually interesting because this is one of the early commentators who explains this to us, 7a. Why don't you read, uh, please, Charles Barbara, 7a? The same way the lunar cycle has no years, the solar cycle, too, has no months. The Christian calendar is based on the solar cycle. They saw that the moon renews itself 12 times during this cycle, so they divided the year into 12 and called each time period a month, as it is approximately the same time period as a lunar month. This decision was not based on any intrinsic reasoning. Keep on reading. The Muslims assumed a similar method. Their calendar is based on the lunar cycle, the first day of their month being the renewal of the moon. They saw that there are 12 months in a solar cycle, and between the solar and lunar year, there is only a difference of 11 days. Therefore, they count their years according to the lunar year, and every year their holidays begin 11 days earlier on the solar cycle. A famous example, Ramadan, everyone knows, shifts every single year. Ramadan is the, the entire month, and that month will be different every year. So in the Muslim ca ca calendar, years are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Years are arbitrary. They wanted to somewhat match up. What's important is a month. A month is the cycle of the moon. That's a natural phenomena. They wanted to somewhat match it up with the solar, so they decided there should be 12. 12. The flip side is true. The secular Christian calendar is solar. There's nothing special about a month. It's our, what's special is the 365 and a quarter. They were looking for a, a good way to, to divide it, and in the end, they stuck with 12. Each one is, one thing is built in, and one thing is arbitrary. And here's where Ev the Evan Ezra writes, that's what sets us apart, 7b. God commanded in his Torah to observe each festival in its appropriate time. This is what he meant when he said, Guard the month of spring and make a Passover offering to God. Accordingly, if the month of Nisan will not end up during the spring, we observe Passover one month later by adding an extra month to the year. And so too, Shavuot is called Harvest Festival and Sukkot the Gathering Festival. And if you didn't add an extra month in the year, Sukkot would no longer be the Gathering Festival and Shavuot would no longer be the Harvest Festival. It would shift 11 days every single year. Okay. So this is why we have to add years. Once upon, add months. months. Once upon a time, there was something, a game time decision they made every single year. Talk about the early Groundhog Day. <laughs> if it's getting close to Passover and it's still snowing hard, we got a problem. We got to add in an extra month. And a lot of things were different back then. There was no set calendar. You couldn't plan your calendar. Just imagine at the beginning of the year, you couldn't plan when Passover was because you never quite knew how things would fall out, both whether it would be a leap year or not. But beyond that, they did not yet know whether each month would have 29 or 30 days. And we've discussed this before. It's about 29 and a half days in the lunar cycle. 
28 and a half. 20, no, nine and a half, actually. Oh, okay. It is 29 and a half. Okay. Um, different than a secular calendar, which is 30 and a half, essentially, right? Because it's 360. Right, right. So some of 30 and 31, you can't have a half a day. So the way it worked was in the old days, was if some months were 29, some months were 30, and it depended on whether or not the witnesses saw the new moon. They would have to go at night and see that nothingness, and then that first, first sliver. Run out to Jerusalem, give the news, and that would be night number one. one. That would be night number one. <coughs> if it was cloudy. Then, interesting, if it was cloudy, then that month would, by default, not have 29 days, but 30, 30 days. Hmm. What's well, fascinating about that is very grassroots. It wasn't, you're right, even if it was cloudy, the month would have 30 days. It could never have more than 30 days. And the, so if no witnesses came on that 30th day, automatically the next day would be still day number one. So the only question was whether or not there would be a 30th or not a 30th. And that would be another way I can imagine. If there's a lot of cloudy days, they would get further pushed, you know. Well, and then, you're gonna, then you have a 25-day month because, hey, there's a new moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true. I didn't. It, it would be self-correcting. Correct. Correct. But it was always 30 max. It was always 30 max, so they never had to deal with that. Um, that changed when that changed when um, the temple was destroyed. The whole court system was dissolved. There was no longer a central Jewish leadership. Jews were scattered, and that is when the formal calendar, as we have today, is made. And that is pretty much alternating 2930, with some exceptions. If anyone is into astronomy, it's one of the most difficult areas of Jewish law to learn. There are 30 chapters in Maimonides that discuss how the calendar works. It's complicated, I don't get it. Tons of mathematical equations throughout. And it's amazing how sophisticated it was 1800 years ago. Uh -huh. But more or less, this is the system. There's a 19 year system, okay? 19 year system. Years three, six, eight, not three, six, nine. Three, six, eight, 11, 14, 17 and 19 are leap years. Excuse me, how, how is this? I'm... So let me explain that. In the, I'll, I'll take a question in a moment. In this 19 year system, mm -hmm. if it was every third year that was a leap year, it would be 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. And then you would have 6 out of, you know, every three years would be a leap year, 6 out of 18. But it's not exactly that. It's 7 in 19 years. So 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, 19. And I guess the math of it helps the Lumi solar calendar align. Correct. And that math is necessary for it to align. If it was every third year, it would not align. So which years is Passover going to be even later than any other year? Either the, the times when it's typically a leap year is every third year. You getting me? Did I lose every people here? Oh, typically, oh, the, eighth year. the eighth and the 19th. The 8th and the 19th year are both leap years, but they are a leap year where it was just two years it's since like the last... It's, it's, it's two years since the last leap year, not three years since the last leap year. To put it very simple, That's normally... It's so late. Correct. Normally, every three years is a leap year. Mm -hmm. So, let's just give a simple example. Simple example, everyone. Past Hanukkah is December 20th. The next year, it's December 10th. The next year, it's December... Wait, first is the 20th. Then is 10th, then is 1st, and then you insert the extra month. That's the typical cycle. You lose 10, 11 days every year, and then you insert the extra month. Every now and then, however, you insert the extra month, not every three years, but every other year. That's what's happening this year. This year is year 19. The other interesting piece about this is your Hebrew and English birthday will be the same every 19 years. So mine was, um, okay, it, like last year. We, mine so was, every 19 years, the wait, whole wait, wait, cycle I, repeats. I don't know about that, because the, the um, modern calendar, the leap year to worry about, too, every four, every, approximately every four years. Uh, so so it, ought, it, ought to, uh, it ought to move around a little bit. So it might, move, might be a one-day discrepancy. Um, good, Brian, good point, because it might be a different place in the good in point. A, in that four-year cycle. There could be a one-year discrepancy, yeah. but generally speaking, every 19 years, things are exactly the same, and this is the end of the 19 years this year. Mm -hmm. So that is, that, that, yeah, because it was only two years since the last leap year. So that is <coughs> what it, that is cool. And that way we can ensure 
that Passover always remains in the spring. That's what's yeah, most which important. Is the primary objective. And that's the primary objective because the Torah says it must be in Aviv. And as a result, the month that's added is the one just prior to springtime. All right. What does it all so, have to so do? What is the lesson here? So we make our. You had a question first. So, I'm sorry. So many questions. <laughs> <gasps> I want to just try to review everything. The calendar, the calendar, the moon, the lunar calendar is significant. Yes. To the Jewish, yeah. absolutely. And that's usually. Twenty-nine or thirty days. Twenty-nine or thirty days. Which leaves us to about three hundred and fifty-four days in the Jewish year. One more time, dear. Three hundred and fifty-four days in the Jewish year. No, three hundred and fifty-four no, days. No, three fifty-four. Oh, 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 54, right, right. Which is short, roughly eleven days from the three sixty-five secular counterpart. So we lose ten to eleven days every single year, which requires the leap year every couple of years. Yeah. The leap year is every year, every, every four years. Usually every three years, to keep it three simple. Years. And it's put in in February. It's put in in Adar. Year. So it's February, March. Yeah. Yes. So what's the significance of Jewish holidays starting the night before? Sure. So that is because when the Torah actually tells us the Genesis story, the creation story, it says it was evening, it was morning, mm -hmm. one day. So it's from there that we learn that a Jewish day begins at evening. So Friday begins Thursday night. This too, Which in the secular, ca in the secular mm -hmm. calendar is arbitrary. Midnight is a new day. But the Jewish calendar, a night begins the day. <coughs> so that's good. Let us now say, what is the spiritual meaning of all this? It's Meshuggah, that's crazy. Rabbi, <laughs> yes. Um, WPC guy on Blab, again, he's got two comments here about this, <laughs> two, two subjects. He says, uh, Israel did not officially became a nation until after the Hebrews reached Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments, and there at that time agreed to become God's people. Then he goes on to say, just to clarify, the eight days to which I refer earlier included Passover plus the seven, seven days of the festival of unfermented bread. Okay, so but the calendar, he says, the Hebrew calendar makes use of a solar calendar of 29 or 30 days per month, averaging 30 days per month with an intercalendary. And then he goes <coughs> to say a lunar month averages 29 days, 12 hours, and 44 minutes. You see why it's not exactly 29 and a half. Say that again, it was 29, 29 12 days, 12 hours, and 44 minutes. So you see why it's not exactly 29 and a half. So I, the second issue I can't address today because of time um, about, about the festival of the Pesach discussion. The first question he raised, you're right, we only became a people with a constitution when we got the Torah, but we are still identified in the Torah as a nation um, um, earlier than that. So Moshe gathers the people together and he instructed them on the calendar even before we formally got the, the Torah. Thank you. All good points. Very, very good. What is the meaning? I, I want to finish the lesson and we'll have questions at the end just because we only have 10 minutes left. It's a little mishug. That's a little crazy. Meaning it's simple if the calendar is all solar. It's simple if the calendar is all lunar. Why is it? What is the spiritual meaning in the fact that we combine both? On one hand, it's a lunar calendar. On the other hand, it has to be reconciled with the solar calendar. But what I is think humans operate on a lunar cycle, being women, <laughs> our, you know, our pregnancies go by the moon, so we must be... So, and that is why actually Rosh women. Chodesh is, is actually celebrated in a special way by women with that, mm -hmm. uh, with that, with that correlation. But yet, all Jews <coughs> celebrate. Um, you, you're saying you that... must have something that... So, so what's them. interesting is, mystically, spiritually, it is two different modes of operating, okay? And let's even use Hebrew over here. Let's not get it to any text. What is the word for month in Hebrew? Chodesh. Chodesh. What else does Chodesh, Chodesh. mean? Yeah. New. The etymology is very important here. Chodesh means month. Mm -hmm. Chadash means new. Mm -hmm. Renew. Chadash, mm -hmm. new. Chadash. 
Um, As opposed to Kodesh. Kodesh is holy, but Chadash means new. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's for a reason. A month is the same word in Hebrew as new because there's a renewal that happens. You mentioned the cycle of a woman. Mm -hmm. The same idea with that idea. It's a fresh start. It's change. Okay? It's change. The idea of a the idea of a month is change. The moon changes every single day. There's growth, and then afterwards it gets smaller. It reaches a peak, it waxes and it wanes. What is the word for year in Hebrew? Shana. Shana. Shana in Hebrew means repeat. That's what the word means. Lishnot means to repeat. Cycle, same thing. The solar, the sun is always shining. It's always the same way. The moon, it looks different every single night. Mystically, this refers to two different types of people. There's the creative, moody, <laughs> crazy individual that is always having to think of new things and doing new things and one day it's this and one day it's that and they're excited and and then there's wake up every single day at 6 45 and i have my bowl of cornflakes i leave the house every single day at 6 you know i come home at this time i'm happy doing the same thing there's the ceo of the organization that has to be super creative and super and then there's the vice president that makes sure that everything runs in a marriage you can have the spontaneous you know, always mm-hmm. needing something new. And then there's the other spouse that is far more. It's okay. two different modes, the way we operate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So here's the question. In our relationship with Hashem, with our relationship with God, which one? One is tradition, tradition. <laughs> Let's do the same thing because that's what Jews always yeah. did, right? Mm-hmm. It's that sense of I'm walking in the same paths of what Jews did. Five years ago, ten years ago, let's not change, let's not ruffle the feathers, let's not embark upon a new. And then there's, the, where's the creativity? Where's the, the moods? Mm-hmm. Where is I'm in the mood for this? I, it comes with your spiritual awakening, your spiritual development. But, correct, but you could define Jews. You can look at Jews and say, you know, two different paths. And I'm not just saying it, it could be true when people identify they're the traditionalists and they're always just doing the same things, even though it does. And then there's those people that, where's the spontaneity in my Judaism? Mm-hmm. Where's the creativity in my Judaism? Where... And the Torah wants us to say that the two were not mutually exclusive. We absolutely need both. We need to be rooted in the solar calendar and doing the same thing because that are the eternal truths given to us on Sinai. We need that sense of this is what Jews do. At the same time, if there's not ideas that move us differently, if we're not excited by a mitzvah in a different way, if there's no room for creativity, if there's no room for spontaneity, there's a problem. How do we marry these two ideas? Well, that's what Judaism needs us to do. And I think so much of the conflict is, is the, un, the, the two sides not being willing to find a way to marry both. But in the calendar, the Torah tells us we need to have both. Let's do these ideas in the Rebbe's own words, and then I'll take questions at the end. Uh, text 9a. There are readily discernible differences between how the sun and moon illuminate the earth. The sun is unchanging, shining, and giving off light each day in the same way. In contrast, the moon is renewed every month, the beginning of the month, in the beginning of the month, the moon first appears as a thin sliver and then waxes and expands, radiating more light each day until it reaches its zenith on the 14th, 15th day of the month. In other words, the sun represents uniformity and stability, whereas the moon represents change and regeneration. Mm. That's why they call people a lunatic. Yeah. Oh, I, I never knew that. Yeah, yes, right. right. And people who are more, um, who are more, I, I don't, yeah, it's the yeah. wrong word. I want to say solid, but more grounded, grounded. more cool, more creative people, lunatics. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, right. Mystically, for a moment, we can say both are rooted in God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. On one hand, God is eternal non-changing mm-hmm. if there is something that if something changes god 
That's a problem. In Kabbalah, it goes to great odds to explain that before and after the world was created, as far as God's essence is concerned, nothing changes because if something changes, then we have a problem. It's not an eternal, limitless, infinite God. So on one hand, God is rooted in eternity, mm -hmm. stability, nothing changes. On the other hand, we say that creation happens at every single second in Jewish mysticism. There is always creation. There's a, it's, the world's not here because it was here always. There is that sense of renewal constantly happening. We need both. God has both components. We need both in our components. Um, text 10 is a fascinating text. We've had a whole lunch and learned about this before. But there's a midrash that has a group of sages arguing about which verse in the Torah is the most important. Someone had a question? No, no, no. no. I have a question. Yes. When you say you should love your fellow man as yourself, as it says here on text 10, mm -hmm. does that mean everybody, or does that mean it's just the Jewish people? So only, so you know what, that, it's, let me finish this idea and we'll do it after class. I want to, we have four minutes left. Sure. Hmm? The short answer is, by, it begins in the family and then it radiates everyone, to mm -hmm. everyone. But there's a much deeper explanation. It begins in the family, but it radiates everywhere. Okay. So there's an argument which verse in the Torah is most important. One sage puts in his vote for love another like yourself. One sage puts in his vote for Shema. And then one gets up and says, in the, in the temple, one is supposed to bring an offering in the morning and an offering in the afternoon. Every single day, without fail, those two offerings were brought. Now, on holidays, there were additional offerings, additional prayers. But every day without fail, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. The sage has made a vote. Rabbi Ploni gets up and says, I agree with the one who says an offering in the morning and an offering in the afternoon. And you're like, huh? That's the most inspiring verse in the Torah? And the answer is it's not about what verse is the most inspiring in the Torah. The question was, which verse is? Most important. All encompassing. All encompassing. And in a certain extent, text 9b, I'll summarize. Some aspects of divine service repeat themselves constantly without fail. A Jew says the Shema every day. We wake up and thank God for life every single day. There are mitzvot that have to be stability. It is there every single day, no matter what. And guess what? That's the sign in a relationship where something is real, when it's dependable, when you know without fail that person will be with you no matter what. And circumstances will not change that. That's what he says, this is the most, that would be the solar part of who we are. But that is not enough. God wants our emotion. God wants our excitement. God wants our spontaneity. And that's where the moon comes into the picture. If we don't have that, there's no creativity. We're just doing things because that's all, something is missing. And hence, Judaism combines both. There's another beautiful text here as well that illustrates the same idea. Text 12, you might have heard this text before. Rabbi Akiva was 40 years old. He never stood and learned Torah before. What changed his mind? He saw water which dripped on a rock, drip after drip after drip. And what happened eventually? There was a hole that erode, the, the rock eroded a little bit. And he said, wow, if the rock has the ability to even erode this, the water has the ability to erode this rock, I'm sure Torah has the ability to make a dent inside of me. And he started learning Torah at age 40, became one of the greatest sages. What a fascinating metaphor. We're all into the Hollywood changes, right? Overnight changes. What inspired him? The day in and day out commitment. That is very much solar based. But that's not enough. That's why we have holidays, certain times in the year, to get a certain excitement about something. Um, and just to finish the story, there was a town that had a clock. The clock was very high up and people would always look up and see what time it is. They changed their clocks to match the official town clock. One day people fetched and they complained, our necks hurt. We always have to go like this and see what time it is. So all the people complained, let's lower the clock, make it much lower. Eye level, it should be on the street level. That's what happened. The city listened, to put the clock on the street level. And then a funny thing happened. Any single time, people's watches were different. The clock, then the town's clock, what would happen? Instead of people adjusting 
their own watch. They would start adjusting the town's watch, and pretty soon the entire thing was no one cared about it, fell in disrepair, no one looked at the clock anymore, it was meaningless. And the same thing is true with our Yiddishkeit. There has to be eternal truths that are based upon the sun that are always there. That's what gives it its importance. It's eternal. We adjust our clock to it. It doesn't change depending on what we want to do. But Judaism is not only that. There has to be the creativity. There has to be the spontaneity. There has to be the emotion, the moodiness, the excitement. And that we get from the moon. And we'll hold it over there. That's what? Oh, that's what it the last text? Which text? All right. Pam requested that we read text 13. And on text 13, it says, when a person passes away, the heavenly courts are going to ask them a few questions. I don't know, have you heard this yeah, before? Yeah, the three questions. So one of them, were, were you in honest in business dealings? Were you children. honest in business dealings? That's number one. Number two is, did you set fixed time for Torah study? And it mm -hmm. highlights that text here. And what's it wants to point out here is, it didn't say, did you study a great deal of Torah? It didn't say, did you become a sage? It didn't say, did you become a teacher? It asks, did you set fixed times? Mm -hmm. The definition of fixed times is something regular <coughs> on my schedule, that my schedule goes after it, it doesn't go around mm -hmm. my schedule. Mm -hmm. And that is the idea of sun. That is the idea of stability. Mm -hmm. And there's something very powerful about that in the consistency, which would be the sun base. Yasha Koach are pointing that out. Yeah. Any questions from the online community? Uh, no question, but one more comment from WPC guy. He says, earlier than when, when you were talking earlier about it, not earlier than the third month of the Hebrew calendar, Sivan, after leaving Egypt, did Israel become a nation? The Torah doesn't reference Israel to Israel as a nation before then. Um, after the third Hebrew calendar. Can you tell the individual? I uh, thank you so much. Great questions. Please, I would love to discuss this together. An email. I know. If you could send me an email at yc, my initials, at chabadofcarry.org, yc at chabadofcarry.org, and I would love to discuss this with you further. So thank you so much for listening. Really, really love the comments, love the feedback, and we can continue it via email. All right. Rabbi, was 19. Um, like arbitrarily picked rather than 20, or does that the, come from... I think the, I think the mathematicians and the uh, yeah, celestial sure. observers figured it out. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I had to figure... Because it, it really comes down to a math. Because if they want the sun rotation, okay, that's 365 and a little bit days. Mm -hmm. And then, well, you've got 29 and a half, and you just got to... It's a, it's a math problem. It's incredible. I mean, that's a, that's a tough math problem, because it's not 29 and a half. As you right, said, it's right. 29, 12, and 44 minutes. So... Having to find a way, I mean, I guess it's, it's what kind of math would that require? <coughs> algebra. Algebra. That, That's all it's algebra. It's not, it's Geometry, not calculus. I mean, you have to calculate. Sorry. Uh, Rabbi, yes. tell me when to stop recording. You can stop recording. Abba, right. Yashika. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and joining the live stream. We appreciate you listening, and we'd love uh, your support. Um, you can donate to um, Nissan Communications on the homepage. You will see the donate button which allows this program to exist. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon. Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson. Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler. Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members. Parent Dome with Ryan Miller. Current Affairs with Amnon Nissan. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.